before introducing our first speaker, I wonder if here at the end of our long year of series on hospitality, if we could express our thanks to Richard Carney for his long-standing, courageous, and heartfelt efforts to welcome the stranger here in Boston. <laughs> Professor Critchley from only a single evening, which he probably doesn't recall, but it was at the home of my colleague Dave Rasmussen and Richard Carney as they were two veritable Marthas stirring up a, a hearty, or attempting to stir up a hearty welcome for you. My husband told me not to go into the details. <laughs> <laughs> Professor I remember it very well, too, so <laughs> 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 Since 2004, Professor Critchley has served as Professor of Philosophy at the New School for Social Research in New York City. Uh, his website on Wikipedia makes it clear, though, that he's not an American. He's an Englishman in New York. Uh, his, his, uh, he taught prior to that at the University of Essex and studied at the University of Essex and the University of Nice. Uh, his early work on the ethics of deconstruction, Derrida and Levinas, was one of the first efforts to point to the ethical dimensions of deconstruction. And I'll just read you a short list of works which he's published during his time in the, in the U.S., uh, which must have been some interesting years given that he came after 2001. Mm -hmm. First, Things Merely Are, Philosophy in the Poetry of Wallace Stevens, Infinitely Demanding, Ethics of Commitment, Politics of Resistance, The Book of Dead Philosophers, I want to get that one, and then with Raina Schurman on Heidegger's Being in Time. Please join me in welcoming Simon Kutcher. Thank you, Leslie. Well, thank you, Richard. And um, thank you for inviting me, and thank you for coming. I'd like to dedicate this talk to, to Bill, from whom I've learned so much over the years. It's going to be fairly hardcore. <laughs> At times, reading a classical philosophical text is like watching an ice floe break up during global warming. The compacted, cold assurance of a coherent system begins to become liquid, and great conceptual pieces break off before your eyes and begin to float free on the scene. To be a reader, then, is to try and either keep one's footing as the ice breaks up, or to fall in the icy water and drown. And both are possible, and both are sometimes appropriate ways of reading. This is true of every page of Heidegger's Being in Time. It's nowhere truer than the discussion of conscience in Division 2, which for me is the most interesting moment in his anxiety. I want to try and reveal where the ice breaks, for it's here that the question of the uncanny and the stranger will begin to make themselves heard. At stake will be bringing the human being face to face with its uncanniness, with the utter strangeness of being human. And thanks to David this morning, Darzai is the happening of strangeness. I mean, that's very much the thought. My title is, I love this title, The Null Basis Being of a Nullity, or Between Two Nothings. Snap. <laughs> <laughs> you, got, and you need these quotes because I'll be working very closely with these quotations. So um, you've all got those, right? Mm -hmm. got the quotations. As you all know, what Heidegger is seeking, Division 2 of Being in Time, is an authentic potentiality of being a whole, which turns on the question of the self, not the subject, but the self. If Dasein's inauthentic selfhood is defined in terms of das man, and this is something over which I exert no choice, then what Heidegger is after in Division 2, Chapter 2, is a notion of authentic selfhood defined in terms of choice. So, I either choose to choose myself as authentic, or I am lost in the choiceless publicness of Dasma. Heidegger, Heidegger's claim is that this potentiality for being a whole, for being authentic, is attested to in the voice of conscience. Quotation one, um, if we analyze conscience more penetratingly, it's revealed as a core. Dog-like bark. Calling is a mode of discourse. The call of conscience has the character of an appeal to Dasein by calling it to its own most potentiality for being itself, 
and this is done by way of summoning it to its own most being guilty. Conscience is a ruf, a call. The call is a mode of aida, discourse, talk, a silent call, as we will see. It has the character of an anruf, an appeal, an appeal is a summons or a convocation, alfruf, to Dasein's own most being guilty. As we will see, what Heidegger means by guilt, which is something closer to lack in the Lacanian sense, or indebtedness, uh, rather than a sense of moral guilt or culpability. Heidegger insists that our understanding of this call, hearing this call, unveils itself as wanting to have a conscience, gewissen haben wollen. And adopting this stance, making this choice, choosing to choose, is the meaning of resoluteness, entschlossenheit, or decidedness, or being determined, or possessing fixity of purpose. That's the basic shape of the argument of chapter two, division two, of the terminology used. Heidegger argues that the call of conscience calls one away from one's listening to the base self, which is always described as listening away, hin, her, and auf, to the hubbub of ambiguity. Instead, one listens to the call that pulls one away from this hubbub to the silent and strange certainty of conscience. The call, he says, is what calls from afar unto afar. It reaches him who wants to be brought back. A little perhaps like the daimon. To what is one called in being appealed to in conscience? What is one, to what is one being, uh, to what is one called? One is called to one's eigener selbst, to one's own self. Dasein calls, da conscience calls Dasein to itself in the call. So, what gets said in the call? Heidegger's crystal clear on this. What gets said in the call is nothing. It's like Cordelia in, in King Lear. Right? This is quotation two. But how are we to determine what is said in the talk that belongs to this kind of discourse? What does the conscience call to him to whom it appeals, taken strictly, Nothing. The call asserts nothing, gives no information about world events, has nothing to tell. <coughs> Least of all does it try to set going a soliloquy in the self to which it has appealed. No, no, nothing gets called to this self, but it has been summoned to itself, that is, to its own most potentiality for being. So the call contains no information, nor is it a soliloquy, like the ever indecisive Danish prince. It is the summoning of Dasein to itself that occurs silently. This picks up on a remark on 271 that Heidegger makes. He says, vocal utterance is not essential for discourse and therefore not for the, not for the call either. This must not be overlooked, he says. So conscience discourses in the mode of silence, in and as what Heidegger calls reticence, verschwiegenheit which is given an extraordinary privilege in the discussion of discourse in being in time. Reticence is the highest form of discourse. One says most in saying nothing. The logic of the call is paradoxical. On the one hand, the call of conscience <coughs> that pulls one out of the immersion and groundless floating in Dasman is nothing else but Dasein calling to itself. Calling to itself by saying nothing, it's not God calling to me, it's not my genes calling to me, it's me, myself, and I. But this gets more complex. And this is where it begins to get more complex. Quotation three. But is it at all necessary to keep raising explicitly the question of who does the calling? Is this not answered for Dasein just as unequivocally as the question to whom the call makes its appeal? In conscience, Dasein calls itself. In Givison, um, does I move six steps? This understanding of the caller may be more or less awake in the factical hearing of the call. Ontologically, however, it is not enough to answer that Dasein is at the same time both the caller and the one to whom the appeal is made. There's a division in the call. When Dasein is appealed to, is it not there in a different way from that in which it does the, the calling? Shall we say? that its own most potentiality for being itself functions as the caller. Indeed, 
The call is something which we ourselves have neither planned, nor prepared, nor voluntarily performed, nor have we ever done so. It calls against our expectations and even against our will. On the other hand, the call undoubtedly does not come from someone else who is with me in the world. There's the paradox, the call comes from me, from me, and yet from beyond me, or over me. And this is very interesting. <clears throat> the call comes from me, does I'm calls to itself in conscience, yet it comes from beyond me, or over me. Uh, der Ruf kommt aus mir und doch über mich. Is this, is this über mich, which is interesting, like the über ich in Freud, perhaps, which is translated poorly as the super -ego. Which happens against my will and is something that I do not voluntarily perform. So Dasein is both the caller and the called, but there is no immediate identity between these two sides or faces of the call. How do we explain this, non-identity of the caller and the call? How do we explain this division at the heart of the call of conscience? Which is something that Heidegger says insists, is something that everybody agrees we all hear. It's a separate talk. So how do we explain this division at the heart of the core? In Freudian terms, this is the division which is constitutive of narcissism in the 1914 essay, separate topic. In order to explain the division within the call, Heidegger folds the analysis of the call back into the care structure. The situation of Dasein being both the caller and the called corresponds to the structure of Dasein as both authentic and inauthentic, as anxious potentiality for being or freedom, and thrown not lostness in Das Mann as truth and untruth. So, structure of care. Insofar as I am a thrown project, I am both the caller and the called. And this takes Heidegger back in a fascinating way to the discussion of uncanniness. This is where uncanniness comes in. The first appears in the discussion of anxiety in paragraph 40 of Being in Time. Heidegger asks here, what if this Dasein that finds itself in the very depths of its uncanniness should be the caller of the call of conscience? And this leads us to the idea of the alien or stranger voice, the fremde Stimme. And it's the same uh, formulation that Nietzsche uses in the 1886 preface to the Birth of Tragedy. Again, that's another story. But if you go to quotation four, um, in its who, the caller is definable in a worldly way by nothing at all. The caller is in its uncanniness, primordial, thrown being in the world, as the not at home, the bare that it is, in the nothing of the world. The nothing of the world. There's no quotation marks in the German. The nothing of the world. The caller is unfamiliar to the everyday they self. It is something like an alien voice or a stranger voice. What could be more alien or strange to the they lost in the manifold world of its concern than the self which has been individualized down to itself in uncanniness and been thrown into the nothing? This is why the quotations are important, not because you think I was making it up. <laughs> yeah. The self is thrown into the nothing of the world. No quotation marks. And into that nothing, I hear the silent call that strikes me as alien. Strictly speaking, and this is the thought that I want to tease out of these paragraphs, the self is divided between two nothings. The self is divided between two nothings. The nothing of the world and the nothingness of pure possibility revealed in being towards death. It's akin to being between two deaths in Lacan's 7R7, seven seven, but perhaps even more radical. The self is nothing, but the question Heidegger is asking is, what is the self? The self is nothing but the movement between two nothings, the nothing of thrownness and the nothing of projection, which is to say that the uncanniness of being human, being a stranger to oneself, consists in a double impotentialization a double impotentialization, a double nothing. At the core of this is an inquiry into the nature of impotentialization. Heidegger insists, quotation five, that the, the uncanny call calls silently. Five, the call does not report events. It calls without uttering anything. The call discourses in the uncanny mode 
of keeping silent. They've done this, does this only because in calling the one to whom the appeal is made, it does not call him into the public idle talk of the they, but calls him back from this into the reticence of his existent potentiality for being. We're called back from the nothing of the world into the reticence of our existent potentiality for being. When the caller reaches him to whom the appeal is made, it does so with a cold assurance, kalter sicherheit, strong term, which is uncanny, but by no means obvious. <clears throat> Uncanniness then pursues Dasein down into the lostness of its life in the they, in which it has forgotten itself. And Uncanniness tries to arrest this lostness in a movement that Heidegger will call in the next chapter of Being in Time, repetition. It is only the self's repetition to itself, of itself, it's only in that repetition that it can momentarily pull clear of the downward plunge of dust mark. There is a repetition compulsion at work here. When the self ceases to repeat itself, it forgets. It ceases to be itself. You can say more about that. But Heidegger completes this one of arguments in quotation six. <clears throat> the proposition that Dasein is at the same time both the cola and the one to whom the appeal is made has now lost its empty formal character. It's no longer formal as it is earlier in the chapter. And it's obviousness. Conscience manifests itself as the call of care. The cola is Dasein which in its throneness it's already, it's being already in, is anxious about its <coughs> potentiality for being. The one to whom the appeal is made is the very same Dasein, summoned to its own most potentiality for being, ahead of itself, the structure of care. Dasein is falling into the they, as being already alongside the world of its concern. And it is summoned out of this falling by the appeal. The call of conscience, that is, conscience itself, has its ontological possibility of the fact that Dasein in the very basis of its being, is care. So the call is entirely intelligible in terms of the care structure uh, outlined in being time. That is, as thrown projection or as falling, factical existence. And we do not need to resort to other powers to explain conscience. We do not to resort, need to resort to God as in, say, Paul or Luther, or an idea of public conscience or an idea of world conscience. Heidegger argues against those in, in this chapter. So what does the uncanny call give one to understand? Right? Guilty! I mean, guilty is the... <laughs> <laughs> exclamation mark, page 325. What does the uncanny call give one to understand? Guilty. Dasein is guilty. What does this mean? The being of Dasein is thrown projection. Insofar as Dasein is, it always has its being to be. That is, its being is a lack. It is something that is due to Dasein. A debt that it strives to make up or repay. Attend to the monetary metaphors here. This is the ontological meaning of guilt as should, which means guilt, wrong, or even sin, but it can also just mean debt. To be schuldig is to be guilty or blameworthy. But it also means to give someone their due, to be owing, to be in someone's debt. Schulden are debts which have, as Nietzsche shows us powerfully in the Gene Edge of Morals, a material origin. Debts have a material origin in the nature of contract. I've tried to analyze this at length in relation to Shakespeare's mode of divinity will appear in next month's Harper's an article about the recession. Separate issue. But interesting in relation of debt in relationship to the recession. Life is a series of repayments. Oh, it's going on down <laughs> Life is a series of repayments on a loan that you didn't agree to with ever increasing interest, which will cost you your life. It's a death pledge or a mortgage. As Heidegger perhaps surprisingly writes, although he too was writing in troubled economic times, life is a business whether or not it covers its costs. Page 336, 336 of the entire. Debt is a way of being. It is the way of being, which is why credit 
and the credence in credit, its belief structure, is so important. Heidegger runs through various means of guilt in uh, these pages. Guilt is understood as, as having debts, being responsible for or owing to another. I won't go into this now, but what is, it's very interesting to watch Heidegger try to separate his conception of guilt from the usual concept of guilt as responsibility to others or from any idea of guilt understood in relation to the law or the idea of the ought, the zolom, the Kantian ought, who's he uh, Hegel's critique of which Heidegger implicitly follows in these pages. What Heidegger is trying to get at, obviously, is an ontological meaning to guilt and avoid the usual legal or moralistic connotations of the word. What he's aiming for is, if you like, a pre-ethical or pre-moral understanding of guilt or perhaps an originarily ethical understanding of guilt. Can he do this? I don't know, but let's follow him a little bit further into the really wild pages of being in time, in my view. As Heidegger tirelessly insists in these pages, Dasein is a throne basis, ein geworfener Grund. It projects forth on the basis of possibilities into which it has been thrown, which is to say that Dasein is a null basis. It's a null basis. He then makes the fascinating remark, and this is, we need to go through this in the German, but we can't, but here it is in quotation seven. In being a basis, that is, in existing as thrown, Dasein constantly lags behind its possibilities. It is never existent before its basis, but only from it and as this basis. Thus, being a basis means never to have power, never to have power over one's own most being from the ground up. One doesn't have power over one's self, over one's thrownness. This knot belongs to the existential meaning of thrownness. It itself, being a basis, is a nullity of itself. Nullity does not signify anything like not being present at hand or not subsisting. What one has in view here is rather a knot which is constitutive for this being of Dasein, its thrownness. The character of this knot as a knot may be defined existentially. In being itself, Dasein is, as a self, the entity that has been thrown. It has been released from its basis, not through itself, but to itself, so as to be as this basis. Dasein is not itself the basis of its being, inasmuch as this basis first arises from its own projection. Rather, as being itself, it is the being of its basis. Discuss. <laughs> <laughs> Dasein is a double nullity. It is simultaneously constituted and divided around this double nullity. This is the structure of throne projection, the meaning of care, and the ontological meaning of guilt. That is, Dasein is guilty, it is indebted doubly. It is null at the heart of its being. It is essentially doubly lacking. Throne projection means, as Heidegger says, das nichtige Grundsein einer Nichtigkeit. The null, the null basis being of a nullity. The null basis being of a nullity. And this, lo and behold, is nothing else than the experience of freedom. Not the concept of freedom, but the experience of freedom. 331, there's that same quotation. Oh no, different quotation on 331. Let's skip over the quote. <coughs> Uh, no, I've got to read quotation eight. This is what I should have, I should have um, done this. This will make what I just said crystal clear. Look. <laughs> <laughs> so imagine that I missed quotation eight. That's very important. Yeah, quotation eight. Not only is the projection as one that has been thrown determined by the nullity of being a basis, as projection, it is itself essentially null. Right? So we have, on the one hand, the nullity of the nothing of the world, my throne basis, which I have no power over, and on the other hand, the nullity of my projective capacity towards my potentiality of a being, which is also null. This does not mean that it has the ontological property of inconsequentiality or worthlessness. 
What we have here is rather something existentially constitutive for the structure of the being of projection. The nullity we have in mind belongs to Dasein's being free for its existential possibilities. Freedom, however, is only in the choice of one possibility, that is, in tolerating one's having, been, one's having chosen the others and not being able to choose them. In the structure of thrownness, as that in that of projection, there lies essentially a nullity. Right? So there's a nullity in thrownness, a nullity in projection. That's all I'm trying to show. <coughs> this nullity is the basis for the possibility of the of inauthentic Dasein in its falling. And as falling, every inauthentic Dasein factically is. Care itself, in its very essence, is permeated with nullity through and through. Thus, care, Dasein's being, means as throne projection being the basis of a nullity. There's my quote. And this being the basis is itself null. This means that Dasein as such is guilty. If our formerly essential definition of guilt as being the basis of a nullity is indeed correct. So freedom, you can see, is the choice of um, one possibility in choosing oneself and not the others. But what one is choosing in choosing such a choice is the nullity of a projection that projects onto the nullity of a throne basis over which one has no power. So what is Dasein? Dasein is a double movement of nullity in relationship to the nullity of a throne basis of which it has no power and the nullity of a projection. Freedom is the assumption of one's ontological guilt of the double nullity that one is. Heidegger goes on to show that this existential ontological meaning of guilt is the basis for any traditional moral understanding of guilt. His phenomenology of guilt, like Nietzsche's in the genealogy of morals, claims to uncover the deep structure of ethical subjectivity, which cannot be defined by morality because morality already presupposes it. Rejecting any notion of evil, as privatio boni, Heidegger asserts that guilt is the pre-moral source for any morality. It's beyond good and evil. Is guilt bad? No, but neither is it good. It's simply what we are. We are guilty, such as Kafka's share of eternal truth. Heidegger brings a large number of themes together in an enormously powerful way in quotation nine. He says, this is where we come back to uncanniness. And uncanniness at the beginning, now we're going to come back to it after we've gone through this strange uh, analysis of the dominality of Dasein. The call is the call of care. Quotation 9. Being guilty constitutes the being to which we give the name of care. In uncanniness, Dasein stands together with itself primordially. Dasein stands together with itself. It's a strange formulation, isn't it? What's uncanny is standing together with oneself. Uncanniness brings this entity face to face with its undisguised nullity which belongs to the possibility of its own most potentiality for being. To the extent that for Dasein as care, its being is an issue, it summons itself as a they which is phatically falling and summons itself from its uncanniness towards its potentiality for being. The appeal calls back by calling forth. It calls Dasein forth to the possibility of taking over an existing, even that throne entity which it is. It calls Dasein back to its throneness, so as to understand this throneness as the null basis which has to be taken up into existence. The Dasein is this movement, this, this back and forth between the nullity of throneness and the nullity of projection. This calling back in which conscience calls forth gives Dasein to understand that Dasein itself, the null basis for its null projection standing in the possibility of its being, is to bring itself back to itself from its lostness in the day. And this means that it is Guilty. There's an awful lot going on here. Guilt has been shown to be the innermost meaning of care. It's very movement, it's kinesis. And all Heidegger's trying to do here is to think kinesis, think movement, and think the human being in movement and as movement. 
This movement, the movement of throne projection, or what I prefer to call throne throwing forth, is the structure of the call, which calls back by calling forth, as he says in quotation nine. It calls Dasein forth to take over its potentiality for being by taking it back to its throneness and taking it over. But again, look at the words here. Dasein is the nichtige Grund seines nichtigen Entwurfs. It's the nothing ground of its nothing projection. It's a double nothing, a double zero. Dasein is the movement of throne projection, which means that it is the null basis for a null projection. And guilt is the movement, the kinesis of this nullity. A movement back and forth, for und zurück, to and fro, as Beckett would say. Such is the strangeness of what it means to be human. The uncanniness of being brought face to face with ourselves without reference to any external agency like society or God or whatever. The human being is the utter strangeness of action between two nothings. It is a potentiality for being whose sole basis, limit, and condition of possibility is a double impotentialization. Which, of course, is also to say that da is a condition of impossibility for that, an existential quasi transcendental. So, what is the human? The human is the uncanniness of a movement between a, of a double impotentialization. That's, that's my formulation. Impotence, finally, is what makes us human. We should wear it as a badge of honor. It's the signal of our weakness, and nothing is more important or impotent than that. I just finished a paper on impotence co-written with my wife. <laughs> that's on impotence in Freud. And if you like, uh, Freud's thought is that impotence is the basic the condition of civilization. I could say more about that in relation to his essays on the psychology of love. So the idea here is, is that what, so far from the, as it were, heroic virility of being that we're accustomed to think of in relation to Heidegger, potentiality of being, what underpins the Heideggerian project in being in time is a, is a movement of impotentialization at both ends, thrownness and projection. And that's all the human being is. Heidegger insists that Dasein does not load guilt onto itself. It is, in its being, already guilty. Dasein is guilty, always already. What changes in being authentic is that Dasein understands the call, understands the appeal of conscience and takes it into itself. Dasein as authentic comes to understand itself as guilty, which means that Dasein as potent comes to understand itself as impotent. Dasein as potentiality for being comes to understand itself as impotent, radically, constitutively. In doing this, Dasein has somehow chosen itself. Er hat sich selbst gewählt. This is interesting. What is this choice? Because this chapter is all about choice. What is chosen is not... Um, If what we don't choose in living with them is not to have a conscience, what we choose is choosing to have a conscience, what Heidegger calls Gewissen haben wollen, wanting to have a conscience, a second order of wanting, a wanting that wants the want that one is. So what one wants in wanting to be authentic is one wants the want that one is. I am wanting, right? I am radically impotent at the level of uh, of being, that's the thought. And I want that in the core, in, in being authentic. That's what being authentic is. It's not driving a car well, like Draper's thinks. Yeah. That's a bit bitchy, isn't it? <coughs> um, or playing basketball very well, whatever it might be. In quotation 10, the last quotation, um, so in wanting to be the one that one is, this is, this is making a decision. It's making an ontic, existential decision right, to be the one that one is. Heidegger says, um, when Dasein understands, when Dasein understandingly lets itself be called forth to this possibility, this includes its becoming free for the call, 
It's readiness for the potentiality of getting appealed to. In understanding the call, Dada is in thrall to its own most possibility of existence. It has chosen itself. It's chosen itself. In the last quote, wanting to have a conscience is rather the most primordial existential ontic presupposition for the possibility of factically coming to owe something. Factically coming to be in debt, right? Something which the graduate students here, I'm sure, are very familiar. In understanding the call, Dasein lets its own most self take action in itself. That's the phrase, take action in itself, in sich handa, in terms of that potentiality for being which it has chosen. Only so can it be answerable or responsible, fair and Heavy work, right? Uh, what's the thought here? Responsibility, answerability, originary ethics, well, how do we want to finesse that? Let's just say responsibility, answerability, consists in understanding the core, in wanting to have a conscience. And this choice, Dasein's choice of itself, is taking action in itself, in sich handeln, which reminds us of a phrase of Heidegger's of a, a later vintage, which of course runs in the following way, which you, you all know. We are still far from pondering the essence of action decisively. It is a word, action, that Heidegger both uses and continually reminds us that he wants to avoid using. In being in time, as Derrida has shown masterfully, and Derrida is, let's just remember, the best reader of Heidegger that we have, just in case we uh, overlook that fact. Uh, the logic of Heidegger's avoidances is crucial here, right? It's a word that he avoids and uses. What might action mean conceived of in relation to the double nullity that we've described? What might action mean? What might potentiality for being mean when its condition of possibility and impossibility is a double impotentialization? What might action mean in such circumstances? To perhaps anticipate another talk, such a conception of action might be called tragic. Might be called tragic. Introduction to metaphysics would be a way of thinking that. The reading of Oedipus and uh, of Oedipus Rex and Antigone. I, I prefer to call it tragicomic. As one of Beckett's gallery of mori mor moribunds. One <laughs> of Beckett. <laughs> Three lines out. As one of Beckett's gallery of moribunds, Molloy asks himself, tongue deep in his cheek, from where did I get this access of vigor? From my weakness, perhaps. And um, it's in relationship, hopefully you can perhaps see what I'm up to, opening the door to a slightly heterodox reading of Heidegger that would ultimately open into the question of the tragic comic. But that's another question for the day. Thank you for listening. Richard and then Jeff. Um, just to tie it up with the theme of the conflict, hospitality. Um, the notion of uncanniness as unheimlichkeit, mm. uh, Dasein is uh, not at home in the world. Okay? It's in a sense uncanny because home. So my question is this. Is Dasein capable of hospitality to the stranger? To come back to two quick quotes from the first page. In conscience, Dasein calls itself the call undoubtedly does not come from someone else who is with me in the world. Thirdly, the caller is unfamiliar to the everyday. They serve, it's something like an alien voice. Mm -hmm. Now, the like an alien voice interests me there because I just well, wonder... Like, it, the like the voice of the friend in Division 1. The voice of the friend right. of Dasein carries right. yeah. So is there really an alien in Heidegger apart from an authentic Dasein that calls to the Dasein lost and thrown in the world. Mm -hmm. you know, is, is there a radical alterity, or is there not what Heidegger one paragraph calls existential solipsism, that the Dasein is actually still caught up in itself to the extent that it's calling itself back. It's the other in itself that's calling itself back to authenticity, 
as a being towards death who totalizes itself in and through death. Mm -hmm. So where I would ask in this world, in this ontological world of Dasein authentically calling and answering itself, where is the homeless one? Where is the migrant? Where is the outsider? Where is the foreigner? Mm -hmm. Where is the widow, the orphan, and the stranger? I mean, are these just ontic persons that Dasein can never care about <coughs> as others? Or is there, do you think, a real ethic of hospitality in, the, in uh, Dasein and in Heidegger? Um, I don't know. I, mean, I, I don't know, honestly. It's, um, obviously, I've been influenced by uh, Levinas's criticisms of Heidegger. And uh, in a sense, I'm trying to shake those up in this reading. That's what's going on behind the scenes. Um, um, I mean, the way the argument goes in being a time <coughs> is that um, being towards death has these four characters, four criteria, the most important of which is non-relationality. Right? It's my relationship to my death, and dying for another, or another's death cannot be a substitute for that. Right? Making myself a sacrifice isn't gonna, isn't gonna work, heavy word sacrifice. Uh, another's dying is not going to get the death of Ivan Illich, that's not going to do it. Um, uh, so it's non relational, and conscience by a fortiori is non relational too. So going back to what um, David was saying this morning, we have a non relational understanding of finitude and a non relational idea of conscience. It's only in relationship to the strangeness that I am to myself that I can then be, as Heidegger says later in this chapter, become a conscience of others, or a conscience for others. So the, the move, it, it's Heidegger's sort of uh, monistic logic, in my opinion, uh, which I, I think in the re this reading begins to try and prize open. We begin from the one of Dasman, right? We move to the one of the, the, the constancy of the self, constituted through ecstatic temporality, and then we go in paragraph 74 to the one of the folk, right? the one of the people. So it's a one, one, one logic. Right? Heidegger's difficulty is counting to two. Right? And so Levinas's entire critique is, 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 is the, need, the need to count to two. That's what Levinas calls plurality, which is always misunderstood as Arendtian plurality. It's not that, it's plurality within being, that, that my being is split between me and the other. Now, I'm trying to push hard at these bits of being in time. So I think the ice flow, that as it were, autarkic logic of being in time begins to come apart a little bit. I take the point. Jack is next. Uh, thank you. It uh, was really uh, exciting. Uh, two, two points. One is, why are you leaving out falling? I mean, actually, the nullity of design is threefold. It's yeah. not a double, yeah. it's a triple mm -hmm. nullity. It's a triple movement. Kinesis is a tripartite movement. It's a triple impotentialization, which hooks up with the tripart structure of time. So it's yeah. all the twos should be threes, mm -hmm. as an exegetical matter. Mm -hmm. I uh, that point. Secondly, uh, I agree with you about halfway, and that is, I think you've identified the text which pivots you into the, the later Heidegger, or Heidegger II, or whatever you call it, because it, it de-centers Dasein to a certain point, up to a certain point. The half I don't agree with you with, and maybe this is, you don't even agree with yourself on this point, is um, all of this impotentialization and nullity is the seed of heroic Dasein. It's in the face of its nullity that it chooses, uh, you know, in the very teeth of death. Mm -hmm. So th this is this doesn't diminish the, her the heroic character. It, <laughs> it's the scene of it. It needn't. It needn't diminish the heroic. It, it, what could be probably tragic in that sense would be the assumption of that impotentiality, the assumption of the want that I am. In wanting to have it, that would be one interpretation of what Oedipus does in Oedipus, Oedipus the King. He would see that. Um, I, 
another part of me wants to connect this with you know uh, a different understanding of finitude that I associate with Beckett in particular, okay. an idea of finitude as a sort of falling away. Um, uh, there is rapture, or there ought to be in the movement of crutches here, yeah. or the moment where when sucky, sucky Moll and Harry Mack are trying to, let's say, make love. It's not Beckett's work. Um, both of them aged and completely impotent. Him emptying, putting his sex into her, folding it in half like a pillow slip. And he said, and somehow from this, from this situation, they were able to extract something resembling pleasure. And but man learned the meaning of the phrase to his company. <laughs> it's that that idea of to his company that's very much on my mind. So it's that tragic, her, her comic dimension of Heidegger. But I think you know what you say is right. This um, this doesn't. You can see the way this sets up a heroic reading as well, which is what's going to happen in the next chapter of this, of this discussion of ecstatic temporality. I just find this moment just. Um, in Division 2, Chapter 2, just a, a moment where things begin to loosen up. Sam, can we get a, maybe one more question? Sure. They will, they will be taking over. It's two of you. I mean, if you want to take the two of them, let's take the other one. Mine's quick. Simon, where's home? Where's home? You've described Unheimlich and the Swiss. Unheimlich and the Swiss. Where, well, I mean, in other words, there's an emphasis on the, on the not, I don't want to say pathological, but it's not traffic, it's traumatic, what you're describing. You're describing an existence uh, that is uh, tortured. You know, between the two the nullabilities. Mm -hmm. and, and my question, my question is, is where's, where's, where, it's not just Unheim, like it implies that there's got to be a home somewhere. There is. There is uh, a place where we can live and dwell and be where, where, that is not necessarily traumatic. Yeah, but that, that's life with dust man. Mm. That's what so we it's have got to. Be, so only on authenticity. Is that's the canny. Right? That's, ah. that's the canny. That's the familiar. So there's no, there's no possibility for living uh, yeah, outside of trauma. No, no, no but that's life. what we do. The Heidegger's point is that's what we do all the time. We live completely fascinated by this world that we share with with others. That's that's uh, which is which is indeed uh, relational, rich, and meaningful. Well, Heidegger, he's kind of implies it's a fool's paradise. The the the, the one. No, mm -hmm. I don't think so. Okay. I I take seriously the claim. Um, seriously, the claim that he's not making a moral valuation. Mm. Inauthenticity is not bad. Mm -hmm. Inauthentic inauthenticity is a way of a way of being, yes. and people have seen through that for uh, 70, 80 years in a sort of knowing, wry way. You know, wave their copies of Adorno and the rest at that point. But if we really take it seriously, we would then say, well, inauthenticity is where we are. That's home, right? That's not going to go away. Authenticity is just the wanting to want the want that one is. One sees that for the banality that it is, and one for a moment can pull away from it. Master the everyday idea, but never extinguish it. We go back to it. So that's, you, you, you could say that's the cave as well. That's, that's, that's highly good. Maybe one sentence. Uh, yeah, I, think you, and reply. I think you've been uh, seduced by Levinas's critique of Heidegger, uh, and that you're replicating that. Uh, today, um, when Levinas says, you know, that being towards death, the problem is it's always my death rather than the death of the other, which I should be focusing on. And you, you giving us a sort of existential solipsism here. Um, and I think uh, I would turn it right round. I would say if you look at Heidegger's discussion of um, authentic solicitude, of the primor uh, primordial mid -side, that is part of what Dasein is, an inseparable from it. Mm -hmm. And the different ways in which you can relate to the other, authentically or inauthentically, the question of my relation to my death is quite central in the kind of uh, relation I can have to the other. If I relate to the other authentically, I don't just go in there and tell them what the answer is, how to solve their problem. I give them their freedom back to them. In other words, he's using his account of what That's it is. One, chapter four, right? right? He's giving his account of what it is to so understand my own mortality, and using that as a way of understanding how I need to treat the others in mm -hmm. relation to their mortality. Now that seems to me wholly different from the account you're giving of this 
Dasein as it is enclosed, focused on their own death. This is an opening to the other's mortality and central to the way he understands mm -hmm. authentic solicitude. Simon, can we use that as a comment? And <laughs> I'd be perfectly happy to do that and continue it after. Thank you, Simon. Thank you. Bill Richardson, especially under tight time constraints, but he's something of a mythical hero already here at Boston College, having come here first in 1981, so he's taught here for over 25 years, and prior to that at Fordham uh, for 17 years. Uh, he served as director of research at Austin Riggs Center, and he also served as the rock on which we built our psychoanalytic studies minor here at Boston College. I'm especially appreciative of the numerous times he retooled his graduate seminars into the undergrad courses that we needed for the minor. You have my gratitude for that, Bill. Uh, I'm going to read to you. I asked Bill just to send me a short statement about his interest, which he did immediately. And I, I think he probably spent two minutes writing it, uh, but it told me something about the precision with which he always works. So here is his own statement of his interest. He's interested in the philosophical dimension of the role of language in human beings, especially insofar as the use of language in the talking cure, may sometimes relieve some of life's inevitable tensions. <laughs> Two, I like them. Two, I'm currently interested in the role he is of desire in, deline in delineating a so-called ethics of psychoanalysis, and here we see uh, some of the disagreement with Lacan that he is, is working through in his own work. Of course, we should mention, too, Bill's monumental Heidegger through phenomenology to thought and his working through of Lacan's thought in Lacan, Language, A Reader's Guide to It. Now we look forward to hearing his paper, Chasing Shadows, Welcoming the Uncanny. Welcome, Bill Richardson. <laughs> process that began not at 11 o'clock this morning, but it began at least uh, in January, in several months ago, and the, the thinking about it began a long time before that. And uh, the uh, dimension of that project is uh, one that I find impressive, if not to say daunting, 
uh, because what uh, Richard proposed to us all, and that to which we are coming to a, a, a close right now, reads this way, and I'm editing this down for the sake of time. Most philosophical attempts to understand the role of the stranger, human or transcendent, have been limited to standard epistemological problems of our minds, metaphysical substances, body, soul, dualism, and related uh, issues of consciousness and cognition. This seminar intends to take the question of hosting the stranger to the deeper level of embodied imagination and the senses, in the Greek sense of aesthesis. It will ask such questions as, how does the embodied imagination relate to the stranger in terms of hospitality or hostility? Given the common root of hostis that we heard allusion to this morning from, uh, from Jeff, as both host and enemy. This was a study of the bon, uh, 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 Mendenist with which Richard started the entire project. And indeed, he insisted on the ambiguity of the word hostis and the duplicity that's involved. And my first reaction was, now there's a problem. <laughs> and unfortunately, uh, with a one-track mind, that remains the problem. And as we've passed through the intervening months, I've thought to myself, uh, with great admiration what's, for what's been done, it's been remarkably done, uh, but we're just chasing shadows, you know. But the real problem is uh, that ambiguity or that ambivalence in hostess. And that has bothered me ever since, and it remains the one problem that I would have liked, like to address this evening, so that afterwards we can at least talk as, and, and say, well, uh, at least what you said, at least uh, address the problem, uh, as, as uh, I understand it to you. In any case, uh, the, uh, the, the question comes down to, says uh, Richard, uh, it, it will ask such questions, how does one <coughs> embody the relationship to the strange and hospitality of hostility? Okay, we've just mentioned that. We discern between projections of fear or fascination leading to either violence or welcome, that's the, that ambivalence. How indeed do humans sense the dimension of the strange and the alien in different religions, arts, and cultures? And therefore, we come, uh, 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 and, and how then do we deal with the perception of alterity and verticality? which operates as an affective, pre-reflected, pre-conscious level. And there we're into psychoanalysis. And what, finally, are the topical implications of these questions for an ethics and practice of tolerance and peace? That, indeed, was the project. And you must admit that it, it was and remains very ambitious. And uh, when we talked about the logistics and prospects, uh, uh, I was told, and I've learned uh, that this has been verified since, that uh, these are the details. There were 60 participants, 30 students, graduate and undergraduate, and 30 faculty. Drawing from 14 different disciplines, from psychology and philosophy, to education and physics. Collaboration with six Boston area universities, including MIT, Harvard, Brandeis, BU, Smith, and the University of Massachusetts in Boston. And the guest book and uh, guest box designed jointly by MIT, Media Lab, and the BC Film and Fine Arts Department which will be in part of a series of interreligious and intercultural, and I add inter international performances, liturgies, literally, with Glenstall Abbey coming up in July and uh, in Ireland, and then in the following year, if all goes well, in Bangalore, India, at the in Bangalore Intercultural Center in 1910, where these public performances of what we are doing here this afternoon 
will be given a, a public exhibition in another language and in another place. Now you've got to admit that's uh, uh, something to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> I must say, uh, from the beginning, I was a little skeptical, and I uh, had the bad grace to tell Richard, <laughs> <laughs> Richard, uh, this is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but if you bring it off, you'll make Bernie Madoff look like a pike. <laughs> 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 So bringing it off is, is, is what we come to now in a kind of a final word, but as you see what we're doing this afternoon is not a final word at all. So I'm going to respond as best I can in the spirit of my own presence in the seminar, that is to say to react to what seems to me the key problem and uh, ask your help to, uh, to tell me whether mm -hmm. the problem is worth addressing and whether or not addressing it this way is of any help. Because I'm very aware of the limitations of any help that can be offered to the problem that uh, Richard uh, posited in the beginning. How do you explain the same word, hospice, can mean at the same time hospitality at the same time empty? How do you get the two together? How does that possibly make sense? Uh, that said, I have tried to do my best to find some kind of, uh, this was all audiovisual, you understand, so I was trying to find some recent audiovisual material that would pose, pose the problem of uh, the uncanny. Mind you, the uncanny was a title that was given to me simply because I used the word uncanny in a conversation with uh, Richard, which I was trying to express my gratitude for something he had done very graciously for me. And he said, uncanny, that's the word. This is what you talk about in the seminar. <laughs> so uh, the term uncanny was not of my choosing. And I'm doing my best to make sense of having a clear talk. <laughs> uh, so uh, I tried at least to offer some visual aids to start with. And I thought to myself, now what, what <laughs> film is there around that one would call uncanny? And I thought to myself, well, Benjamin Button would be a very uncanny type of thing, a man grown old and grows young. And then I thought to myself, but yeah, but who wants to talk about a uh, Kate Blanchett as an old woman, or Brad Pitt as a squalling infant? You know, this is a fantasy of F. Scott Fitzgerald that should have been left with F. Scott Fitzgerald. <laughs> 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 uh, anyway, it's not an example of the uncanny. Uh, another, uh, another example that <coughs> was recommended to me was this film called Moonlight, which is a film about a, um, an investigator who is basically a vampire and falls in love with his victim. Now, uh, I thought that might be interesting, and, but it, uh, I, I was told that it's the kind of film that the father of a 13-year-old girl ought to see with her father and would do them both good. And I thought to myself, well, yeah, that's very nice, but yeah, I've, I've never had a 13-year-old daughter. Uh, I uh, Richard, I swear, <laughs> I am not now, I have not been, and have never been the father of 13 years old. <laughs> I didn't recommend the film, but. <laughs> <laughs> How universal can that be? Certainly, Kelly is more universal than that. But then, uh, a week or two ago, I uh, awoke in the middle of the night and unable to sleep. I turned on the radio and got the BBC. And they were intervening someone who had just finished a film called 50 Dead Men Walking. And this is, uh, she was the director or the assistant to the director. And this film was about a, a man uh, who, uh, in flesh and blood called Martin McGartland. Now that's his real name. Martin McGartland had been recruited as a teenager in Belfast to become a spy for the uh, British Army as a, uh, amid the, uh, <coughs> uh, the IRA. 
He did this, he was probably trained, and he was very successful for about four years. And the consolation that he got was, well, 50 men uh, are still walking today because you paid, uh, paid us this service. Now, the unfortunate part was <coughs> that the IRA found out about this. And they, they made sh uh, tried to make short shrift of uh, Martin Legartland. They captured him, they tortured him almost unto death. By some quasi-miraculous way, he jumped out of a car over a bridge and fell into the, water, into the river and was able to escape. So he's alive and breathing now, ready to talk about his experience, which must have been excruciating, and has published a book upon which this film was based. Now, the director was saying what a fine job they had done in getting the picture of the troubles, as they're called, from both sides. And she indeed had engaged the confidence of people both in the IRA and the British uh, to talk honestly about the way they felt about things. And she was very happy about the fact that it was, the film was not tendentious. Uh, so uh, that uh, it was a fair picture of everything that they hoped we would do a great deal in the healing process of time went on. And as they were cutting the film, well, uh, she, uh, she had news over the air that the IRA had started up again by shooting a couple of policemen in Belfast. But this was last summer. And she described the feeling of said, oh, no. Mm. She said it was an eerie feeling that we had, that uh, doing everything we had been doing and still the whole problem was still there rotting. And we just held up. Is this going to start up again, as was the general question. And happily, it did not start up again. Happily, for all concerned, the, uh, the general public said, no, we've been that way, and we're not going back that way, happily, so far. So uh, it seems to me now, her use of the word eerie corresponds to what I think the word uh, uncanny really means. It's a normal symbol, a uh, synonym for the word. So I'm taking that as an example of the uncanny. And if you notice what it is, that she uh, was working on something that was very, uh, very carefully done, with every effort at objectivity, to the extent that that's physically possible, and had succeeded, it appeared. And then this sudden news came and shattered, or seemed to shatter, because of this doom or blackness which was in her consciousness and the consciousness of everybody that had been repressed but hopefully gotten past. But nonetheless was real enough to really give her the shivers. And that's what I think is the uncanny. Uh, the uh, happy phrase of uh, Julia Kristeva is to translate the uncanny as l'étrangeté inquietante. Not traumatisant, but a, 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 a strangeness, for whatever that can mean, that is disquieting, upsetting, but it's not traumatic. Okay? It's not that fully dis destructive. So there's a kind of mixed knowing there. There's a knowing of this darkness and the, uh, as I said, all apprehension is stirred by reason of it. And uh, that stirring is called the uncanny. Now, uh, that said, uh, that's an empirical example of, I think, what I think the uncanny is. The really important uh, sense of the word the uncanny is, comes from Freud, of course. Uh, let us say his development of it. Uh, Freud developed this late in his career in 1919 between the uh, Fraser principle uh, and the ego and the id. He was at the height of his speculative powers in terms of the metapsychology that he was talking about. And he took his source from a book by the name of a man by the name of Jensch from 1908 uh, and, and called, uh, entitled The Psychology of the Uncanny. Now, Freud remarks the, f the fact that it's strange that the uncanny, although we can trace the roots of it all through the history of thought, 
has none, nonetheless had not become a theme for psychological reflection until this uh, uh, book in 1908. And it was on the basis of that, the basis of that book that the article on the uncanny by Freud was written in 1919. Now, the book uh, actually is uh, based upon an analysis of a, a tale by E.T.A. Hoffman, who wrote uh, several tales, were put to music by Offenbach. We, uh, we used to hear Offenbach's tale of Hoffman. And one of the stories is a story about a certain Nathaniel. And the gist <coughs> of it is, uh, this, uh, this is called The Sandman. Now, I remember being a whole the young family, and the, the, uh, the, the boy was uh, five or six, whatever. He was allowed to stay up because company was there. And he began to yawn. And he says, oh, 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 sad man's coming. Sad man's coming. And he kind of smiled and, and uh, realized <laughs> the fact of life. And uh, he, uh, so uh, my sense of it was a kind of a cheerful story about a sad man. And the sense of it was uh, that the sad man just does come. He throws this dust in your eyes and makes you sleepy, yes, but he also makes you dream. And it's a wonderful dream you wake up in the morning, everything will be great. So it's a fine that, 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 that kind of story. Except that Nathaniel asked his mother to explain it. And she said, I don't know. So she passed it on to the uh, babysitter who was coming in. The rest was going to take care of him. And the babysitter said, well, you know, the real story is that the Sandman comes and he takes out people's eyes. And he takes them up, and he puts them in a big bag, and he takes them up to his hiding place behind the half moon in the sky. <coughs> and that's pretty scary stuff. You know, so uh, <laughs> so uh, Nathaniel uh, said well, that he was going to work, uh, stay up and, and see <laughs> what this sad man was like, you know, and defend himself if necessary. And, uh, <laughs> and in fact, he did see, he, first of all, oh, the heavy clam, the heavy wooden person who came up after he was in bed and went in to see his father. And they called the door and they muttered quietly in a moment between them. And that was already suspicious. <laughs> uh, but uh, the uh, uh, worst part of it was that he kept coming back night after night, always going to the father, always talking darkly, always carrying something in his sack, and heavy-footed and, and sort of ominous. And soon enough, the father died. Um, my memory is that he was, he was killed, but uh, 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 certainly he died. So we had this combination now of a boy wondering about his fate of his eyes, and also combined with the experience of the father's death. And uh, he apparently got past that particular crisis. But when he got to the university, uh, he had trouble with his eyes and went for an examination. And the trouble came again, and the old, and old anxiety reemerged. Now, that's the basis of uh, Freud's analysis. And the substance of it was, therefore, that this would be an example of the uncanny. Uh, and Freud uh, tells us uh, this, after going through it in detail, and he had already gone into a long explanation of the meaning of uncanny and so forth. Uh, but what he comes down to is saying this. It's a long and careful analysis and worth reading, of course. Uh, but uh, it, the heart of this is, at this point, I will put forth two considerations which I think contain the gist of this short study. In the first place, if psychoanalytic theory is correct in maintaining that every affect belonging to an emotional impulse, whatever its kind, is transformed if it is repressed into anxiety, then among instances of frightening things, there must be one class in which the frightening element can be shown to be something repressed, which recurs. So what we have here, have here now, the repressed experience of childhood is recurring now at the occasion of a medical exam in the university. 
this class of frightening things would then constitute the uncanny. And it must be a matter of indifference whether what is uncanny was itself originally frightening or whether it is carrying some other affect than simply that. In the second place, if this is indeed the secret nature of the uncanny, we can understand why linguistic usage has extended das Heimliche, the homely, into reality, uh, 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 nothing new or alien, but something which is familiar and old established in the mind, and which has become alienated from it only through the process of repression. This reference to the factor of repression enables us furthermore to understand Schelling's definition of the uncanny as something which ought to have remained hidden but has come to light, unfortunately. This then is the structure of the uncanny as Freud sees it. There is a primal uh, trauma of some kind which is kind of repressed, but not to the, state, the extent that it, it is not does not return by recall uh, it, it, it except uh, with any more distance than the attempt to repress it gave. In other words, it's sort of on the fringe of consciousness which is retrieved. And therefore, one can speak of a, of, a, of a kind of dual knowing. There is a knowing of what happened originally, which is canny enough, but the fact that it was insufficiently repressed and it comes back again by a, uh, a, by a trigger of some kind, as it happened to the university student, Nathaniel, uh, there is a, a, another kind of knowing. And that second kind of knowing is uncanny. In any way, the word canny and uncanny has a sort of slippage between them that is based upon a kind of knowing that is only partially, partially repressed. Uh, now, uh, I find that relevant to that case of uh, the uh, 50 dead men walking. Uh, there is a darkness experienced, but still on the fringe of consciousness, and it, 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 it comes to awareness on the occasion of this coincidence, on um, surprising fact that the IRA kicked up their trouble again. Therefore, I'm taking that to be uh, a, an example of the, uh, the uncanny, at least as Freud understands it. And I, I uh, only would add to that that the, the notion of canny and uncanny here is sort of mixed in with uh, the dubious character of the uh, phenomenon. It's not a real, complete repression, it's just a partial one. But it's enough to give the shivers and uh, uneasiness. A, 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 a connoisseur of <coughs> anke, anke tongue. As, uh, anyway, a, a commentator on the notion <coughs> of the uncanny uh, as it appears in Freud was simply an underlines what I'm trying to say that uh, the uh, uh, the German words heimlich, homely, and unheimly, unhomely, are loosely related together to heimisch, native native. And heimlich then can mean familiar, intimate, and cherished. Uh, but its other definitions shade into the apparent opposite significations, such as weird, concealed, and secret, and threatening, and dangerous, and therefore ominous, in the, uh, in the sense. So there is an ambiguity even in the word uncanny. As, uh, and and he, he goes on to say, uh, uh, thus Heimlich is a word, the meaning of which develops in the direction of ambivalence until it finally coincides with its opposite. So that linguistically, what is Heimlich can thus become unheimlich, and for Freud, this ambiguity is a constitu constitutive feature of the special core of feeling that he characterizes as the uncanny. What I want to insist on is simply that the very notion of uncanny 
includes the same ambivalence that we talked about earlier in the relationship that included in the word hostis, which can be both friendly and unfriendly, and they hear both canny uh, and uncanny at the same time. Uh, that's, the, that's the only word, point I want to make uh, at this moment. Now, uh, you will say, well, yes, that's, what's this got to do with welcoming the stranger? I have the faintest idea. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what research has you. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, to go to take one more step, and this will be my last step. Uh, <coughs> Freud did not have the last word. Of course, he's been replaced, or he's, he's honored now as the second Freud, the French Freud, namely Jacques Lacan. And the question is, does Jacques Lacan have anything to say that the unca about the uncanny that could be helpful here? Uh, uh, he, I, I, I understand that uh, uh, Lacan is a conundrum, and I'm also aware that many of you are specialized in him. So I hope you'll forgive me if I go through the basics of Lacan simply so that the cards are all on the table and we can talk uh, uh, about the problem that then emerges. Who was Lacan? Well, you know, he's the uh, born in 1900 and matured in the 40s. Uh, and uh, he had uh, approached Freud in a new way. He was impressed by the fact that if you take the early works of Freud, the real works of creative genius, like uh, the interpretation of dreams, the uh, psychopathology of every work, of everyday life, and uh, dream and uh, jokes and the unconscious. But Lacan notices that they all fill with plays on words, with uh, curiosities that come simply in the way Freud uses language. And so uh, Lacan's argument was the real Freud is there in uh, the early works, namely his fascination with language and his power of analyzing language in such a way that it can prove helpful to people who are disturbed. Now, uh, <coughs> I, uh, Lacan will say, the reason why Freud gets caught up in all this uh, hydraulics, you know, depression and conversion and all that sort of thing, is this was the only language he had uh, coming out of the, uh, the late 19th century that was intellectually respectable in the community from which he came. They were the scientific community. So this was the language that was available to him in 19th century uh, mechanics. And therefore, this is what he used to try and articulate the nature of the unconscious. Whereas Lacan would say, yes, but from 1915 or 16, uh, we have a, a new science of linguistics, which inspired the work of Claude Levi Strauss. Uh, and therefore, we have a new instrument for analyzing, uh, analyzing language and using it scientifically. Uh, and therefore, let us see if we, what we can do with that. That then is his orientation. His fundamental paradigm was then come down to this. Mind you, he's trying to be re reinterpreting Freud. He remains a Freudian to the core. But the language, the, the uh, categories that he introduces to work with are three, which you're familiar with, I'm sure. One is the symbolic, one is the imaginary, and the third is the real. Now, the, 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 the symbolic is the world of language, and the systems of language, and the functions of language, and the uses of language, and the difference between language as system and language as practice, and all that sort of thing. You can see it goes a long way. And Levi Strauss certainly took it a long way. And what Freud, would, what Lacan would say is, I'm just doing, in, for psychoanalysis, what uh, Levi Strauss has already done for cultural anthropology. <coughs> Uh, so, uh, whereas the imaginary is the imaginary that we, we, we have been hearing about uh, all semester, namely the embodied imagination with all that that implies. And I understand the embodiment would include uh, imagination, would include the conscience incarnée of a, a uh, male ponty who would perhaps insist on a certain dimension of that con uh, that. Uh, uh, embodied imagination, and uh, uh, in any case, uh, that's what is meant by the imaginary. Basically, it's a relation, uh, a relationship, uh, one, uh, one to one. That is to say, if I pick this up, uh, I, uh, 
my, my imaginary relationship is a one-to-one -one picture of my mind or my eyes uh, for this particular object. Whereas language introduces a third dimension. It's not a one-to-one -one relationship, but we bathed in it. Uh, and uh, so, but that's the major difference. But the real, what is the real? <coughs> the real is the impossible, he says. The impossible to be re uh, re reproduced by or represented by either the imaginary or the symbolic. And that then becomes a problem. What is the real? for Lacan, because if it has makes sense, this is the arena where I would like to suggest that there may be a relevance for, the, uh, uh, for meeting the, and encountering the stranger in the psychoanalytic terms. Now, uh, if you'll let me uh, present this material as, as I would want to if, uh, to a, as a, a group of uh, people not as sophisticated as yourself. I want to explain briefly what I thought Macron was about. I'd ask them if they had been to the uh, Vietnam War Memorial in Washington. And many, of course, hopefully would say, yes, of course. And it seems to me that that, for me personally, was an experience of the academy. And the reason uh, is that uh, that's this 246 long black onyx piece of stone has inscribed on it the names of 58,000 and more 1,000 people, uh, 58,000 men and women who died in Vietnam. And uh, the wall is so polished that uh, it really serves as a mirror. You cannot look at these names. Well, I knew, or felt that I knew, one of those names. At least their names were familiar to, with people that I had known and did know have people that I had gotten to know because I was teaching at the time. Uh, they were names of students you know, that I knew. And I had talked to the students, as many of us who were around at the time did, and talked to them and tried to counsel them as they faced the problem uh, at that, that you will recall, namely, uh, should I be a conscientious objector? Should I go to Canada? Should I go to Sweden? Uh, should I serve in the army? I don't believe in this and so forth. And uh, so these people were fresh and blood for me. I knew the names, I knew their background, I, I, I knew the inside of the models as well as some of their parents did. You know? And so when I saw those names, they're talking about real people for me. They're just not a list of names of civil war dead. These are, this is real fresh and blood. But in, and that for me is the symbolic. It's captured in those names, is the entire symbolic order <coughs> and its representation in their lives. But beyond that, this black eye background was, as I say, mirror fresh. So it was impossible to look at these names without seeing a personal reflection of myself, which was not very attractive. Because it was the same self that had known those people. Uh, but I only recognize it now imaginatively. It's an imaginative reflection. It's the same self that knew those people and the same self looking at them now. So looking at yourself in the mirror across the uh, stretch now, maybe 20 years, uh, and realizing that you talk to these people and try to teach them, and uh, they're silently shouting at you, and the uh, image on the, in that black onyx reflection is you. Where were you then when they were dying? And where are you now? That did that. What about you? And that was a chilling experience. At, uh, beyond that, the onyx itself is just black, you know. Without its reflection, it's just black. And the blackness itself represents the entire darkness of that dreadful time. And those of you who remember that time know what a dreadful time it was. And it was a quite minor indeed for reasons you don't need further explanation for me as to its meaning. But so for me, that all was about uh, disappeared not into the politics of the time, that was only part of it, but the entire darkness <coughs> that Vietnam suggests even today. It's suggested today by the same feeling of 9-11. 
how do you put 9-11 into words? It is a fact, a dark, ugly fact that is the real. At least my understanding of the real. And I have to tell you that uh, I'm not a very tearful guy, but uh, I uh, began to cry at that experience. and found a place uh, uh, discreetly apart and sort of cried, uh, cried it out for a while. Just thinking of these people <laughs> and thinking, what have I done with my life since, you know, to be faithful to them and to the countless others who went through the same trial. At any rate, uh, that for me is the experience uh, that I, I count as genuinely uh, a, 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 an experience of the uncanny because of the, again, the uh, details I've given. It's a relatively modest ex excitation that comes, that awakens a deep, deep traumatic experience that's never been resolved, really, in terms not of simply the war itself, but in, in my obligation to these students. And we always look back and think of uh, what we could say and did, did and didn't say at a time when we could have been crucial. That said, what does Lacan have to say about this? Well, uh, I want to talk not about the language of Lacan or the imaginary in Lacan, that would take us a long way off, but rather just about the experience of the real. He talked about the real as soon as he began to lecture in 1953. And it, it, it's there by indirection uh, into, uh, into the late 50s, into the uh, uh, seminar on ethics that we were speaking about earlier, when he talks about the real there in a rather unusual way. And he talks about it not as the real, but as the thing, the thing. This will bring up echoes uh, to what Simon has just said and will spark uh, a lot of discussing the notion of the young Kelly as uh, he presented it uh, so well. Uh, and uh, in, the, that he, in the ethics, he for the first time talks about the, the real as thing, as thing. And uh, he comes to that by making the analysis of Freud's uh, project for a scientific psychology which takes us back to 1895, five years before the interpretation of dreams. And there, Freud is trying to have, it's a, it's a work of genius, it's a work of madness, uh, but, but it's, it's pure genius. Um, and uh, he's trying to describe the way a child learns uh, to understand, to talk. I propose what was said this morning, and I found that very, very relevant. Uh, what you were saying to this particular phenomenon uh, that I'm about to describe. Because uh, he, uh, Freud is trying to describe how a child learns to understand things in terms of his own body. It's his only instrument for, for comprehensibility. And uh, Freud described it this way. It sort of pops up unexpectedly, but this is, uh, this is what he says. Uh, he prefaces it by saying, really, the only way a child understands, am, am I being hurt? Am I, mm -hmm. uh, the only way a child understands is to uh, interpret what it apprehends in terms of what it already understands, in the terms of the experience of his own body. And therefore, this is the only language he has, and therefore he absorbs it into the language of his body, or he doesn't. So, uh, having said that, uh, Freud continues, the same will be the case with other perceptions of the object. Thus, for instance, if the object screams, a memory of the subject's own screaming will be aroused, and will consequently receive his own, excuse me, his own experiences of pain. Now, how a, uh, the mothering one, let's assume it's the mother, uh, should scream in such a way that it would need interpretation by the child, uh, that's left to our own fantasy. Uh, but uh, he continues. Uh, thus, he says, uh, Freud, thus the complex of the fellow creature falls into two portions. One of these gives the impression of being a constant structure and remains as a curious 
Ding, in quotes. Put in, in, in the German, it's Aus Ding, right? While the other can be understood by the activity of memory, that is, can be traced back to information about the subject's own body. And the context that, and he's often really. He's saying uh, that, that uh, Freud is suggesting there that there is an experience of the other, the mothering one, the body caretaker, as a thing, a structure, somehow unified, but nonetheless not interpretable in terms of the child's power of comprehension, that is to say, in terms of his own body. Therefore, there is ingredient at that very moment, an experience of the separation of the infant from the mother, a, a, an experience of the other as, first of all, other, and other in no other way than the fact that uh, <coughs> it's something there, it's a thing, and no more than that. Nothing to identify it, nothing to describe it, no way to interpret it, it's just the other as such. Now, this experience of the other is, first of all, this is Freud uh, extrapolating in subsequent texts, and also Lacan commenting on this phenomenon. This first experience, therefore, is the of as ding, as other, and therefore as strange, and therefore as empty of meaning and therefore as foreign, and therefore alien, and because of the difference alienating, <coughs> continues to be the other of the child, and it contains at the same time not only an otherness, but the mother, I'm assuming the caring person is the mother, but the mother yeah, is experienced as completely other. Uh, antecedently, the mother was part of the imaginary child of the world in which she was uh, uh, identified with the mother as part of the wholeness of, of, of life. And now, so that uh, with this experience, this mother is separated from the child and for all intents and purposes lost to the child because now, with the child's experience of otherness, this other is no longer what it was, and there's nothing more than an emptiness for the child. There is a, a, a lack, there is a loss. So that this primordial experience is, uh, of the child is a, a, an experience of loss, but of absolute loss, because it was a loss of anything that could, meaning, could give meaning eventually to a child. A child is stuck with a thing and nothing to help it but the language and imaginary to try and capture it. And basically, that's all that language can do. It can, it, it can try and grasp the real, can try to articulate the real, can try to make accessible the real, but it has no control of the real. The real, as uh, I understand, as I'm understanding now, obviously I'm talking about the way I understand, and the, the real is that ding that's completely indifferent to any nuance, any nuance that language can give to it. So much so that if you take it, this at the, at the at its bone, it comes down to you don't even the words good and bad are extrinsic to the thing. It is beyond the language of good and evil, and that's a beyond good and evil. It is just the thing, the thing. It is therefore the the. Uh, if I may just uh, continue uh, this by a, a clumsy uh, impulse that put my hands on something, it's as if the, the mother and the child were uh, 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 counterparts. You know? And at this moment of scission between them, the mother is separated completely, so the, uh, that absence constitutes an emptiness in the child. Not only an emptiness of the child, but the mother remains an object, right? but a lost object. Mm -hmm. So that 
the experience that follows is that the child's search for other objects are really a search for this lost mother. And I'll turn it up to say that the mother is no more than a lost object. It really was never there in the first place. She didn't present to be, and never thought to be, the wholeness of a child's experience. So the mother, too, is sort of an empty receptacle for this thing and a deposit, if you will, a place to deposit the, all the wishes and hopes and dreams of the child as it pursues its own way to try and make do in this world in which it is found. Now, uh, to uh, just to put this uh, as briefly as possible, uh, there, there is uh, the rest of this world, of course, for the child who, for the moment, is uh, your own you know. And the, 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 the fact of the matter is that as the child grows, of course, other desires come uh, aboard, uh, these, uh, other objects come aboard, and so when we get to the university level, like Nathaniel and the people that we, we deal with uh, almost every day, we are uh, students, uh, they have sets of, of desires or, 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 uh, or drives, if you will, drives that cover, say, the world, this is someone that wants to get married. And that's part of his world. And this one is, wants to finish his PhD. Uh, and that's part of his world. And this one wants to get a job so he can sustain himself in studies. And they can, they can uh, eventually get married. It's in this situation I'm sure we're all familiar with. Yeah. Now, all of those column desires, if you will, I call them, or call them drives, if you will. All those drives pursue certain objects. As you can see, that or the detail that. They pursue certain objects. But those objects are pursued under the guise of some kind of an infiltration into them of the desirability of the lost object. So that the lost object is now considered to be the supreme lost object, the archetypical lost object, because it improves them all. Now, uh, let me say one word uh, to supplement this. This original separation between uh, this lost object of mother and the subject itself, and the subject itself, of course, is uh, all totally lost, uh, empty, uh, is, uh, is, is pursued, as I say, by the, the, the pursuit of these different objects that constitute our daily world. This is simple as that. But what makes the, those objects attractive and uh, useful is the fact that the original lost object the mother has lost, infiltrates in the, all the objects that we pursue to supply to them their ultimate attractability. So that all that the child is looking for in this search for the objects of satisfaction and the objects of need as we experience them are some way of replacing in some tentative fashion what was lost by this original capital loss or profound loss it constitutes the original scission, if you will, as total as the cutting of the umbilical cord. But now that is that is lived and uh, uh, and articulated as the pursuit of the lost object. Now, uh, let me add uh, one other significant thing. This loss of object, namely the mother as totality, you know, realistic or not, this loss of mother. Is a loss for the child, and therefore it's, it's a lack in the child. Mm -hmm. The child certainly is a child in want. It is in want of food, care, and uh, attention, as, as, uh, as you uh, to, to this morning. And that want is, is, means that it is a, a being in want. Mm -hmm. But this one thing is what of the lost object the one thing for that lost fulfillment, this is what's meant by desire. It's basically a lack, a radical lack, a totalizing lack, I'm tempted to say substantial lack, but it's the last thing you want to call the, the child at a substance at this point. But the, the, a, a total lack in the child's being, and that lack in the child's being becomes a one thing 
so that the one thing embodies the entire child, and that one thing is a one thing for this lost object. And all the other objects that we address you know, of any kind share in the wantedness of the lost object. You know, so that the lost object infiltrates all of the objects of our pursuit uh, as and, and the limited desires, desire for marriage, desire for study, and so forth. Uh, so that desire, therefore, uh, is called, uh, this lost object is, is referred to by Lacan as the cause of desire. And in the old Aristotelian term, there's no problem with that. But the, the fact of the matter is the only reason for this desire, the only focus for a desire as a human being, to be a human being, is the lostness of this object uh, that is now summarized by Lacan by the, the word, uh, the level of letter A, the whole term in first. And, uh, so it's referred to as the object of data. The totalizing cause of desire is the lost mother, and uh, that is the cause of desire and its mere, uh, means of sustainment. Uh, that said, uh, uh, there are uh, two things that are at our system. But, you know, one on a long time, but I would much rather finish up and quickly and so that you can uh, have a chance to, uh, to poke out of him. Uh, the, uh, this experience of this ding is an experience of lost fullness, that's for sure. It's an experience of desire, but it's the experience of the lostness of a mother. So there's a, a, a primary and primordial experience of, of attachment that has been interrupted. So that's part of the experience. So there is the element of a fullness that's lost but retained at least as a kind, a kind of residue, and the experience of loss itself. So that original experience combines the ambivalence you know, that we find when language kind of takes over and finds ambivalence in a word like hostis or ambivalence in a word like the uncanny. Uh, that that says uh, what is uh, what is worth uh, what is worth. Uh, there's one one more point to that, uh, or two points. Uh, what's the function of psychoanalysis? Is to find find out what your desire is and uh, take account of it and act accordingly. It's a little bit like the notion of authenticity in, in the economy. Uh, and therefore, if the analysis leads you to saying that this object. This object that you're seeing, this lost object, really never was anything uh, and doesn't mean anything now, then a successful analysis would be to face up to that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Your desire is empty. Now live with it. Or you can look at that, say, and uh, look at that, say, no, no, there is always the words of Augustine. Until I rest, there will no be, be no rest indeed, because there there is a focus, even though experience of loss, nonetheless it can be achieved. Uh, uh, now, even uh, those are ways of, of dealing it, but in, in dealing with it. But in any case, whether we deal with it that way or not, the relationship to the other includes this experience of alienation, of alienation that is potentially pejorative, that is say, demeaning. And it can take on those aspects that uh, Christina describes very well of the abject, because once you get on the slippery slope of the negativity of interpreting the ding, then you can include anything in it that is horrible uh, or disgusting and, uh, uh, and the like. Therefore, uh, the, uh, if that's the case, then a, a mature person who knows this much and knows that what's true for myself is true for you, then let's face the fact that there is in both of us a, a root of disgust, you know, a, root of, a, a root of irreconcilable difference, you know, which constitutes individually the risk that's involved in dealing with someone else 
who's contaminated with the same kind of inescapable poverty and finitude that is described the experience of thus being explained. So that the very least that one can say, it seems to me, in terms of facing the other, is to recognize the fact, look, between us, you know, there is this risk which was insisted upon so, uh, so people this morning. But that risk, risk is inevitable. And the only way that we can get along at all is to see the risk and take the risk. However, taking the risk may mean. So this problem about the perfidy of the, of the neighbor and the, uh, the potential assassin and so forth, or uh, disease, well, that's part of the risk. You know? And uh, it, it depends, takes upon, uh, it gives the responsibility of the one taking the risk to look at the risk and say, no, it's not worth it. You know? For example, taking a trip to Mexico at present time, it's just not worth it. <laughs> so uh, there is a, there's a way of responding to this mutual poverty that consists in being the thing character that's ingredient to all of us and transcends any attempt to posit it or to reconcile it or, 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 or to civilize it with the language of good and bad and, uh, and the images that go with it. Uh, now, uh, is that acceptable? Well, that's, that's my question. Uh, and, uh, but that's as much as I can say about the, the, the danger that's involved, it's ineluctable, the risk that's involved, it's ineluctable, and it's at that point when one takes and makes a prudent judgment, as our friend Aristotle said. Uh, that said, uh, there's only one more uh, point that's worth making, and that is the uh, come back to the role of desire. For a Lacan and a card uh, carrying Lacanian, a desire is nothing much more than the desire for a lost object, therefore a desire for an emptiness. And the only thing to do is recognize that life is, is, is a desire and a pursuit of what is ultimately an emptiness, and make what you can. Okay. But the other attitude is, uh, as we heard this afternoon, uh, an attitude which is not that, uh, that uh, even as discreetly as you want to put it, can find some source of meaning for life and fullness out of emptiness that, that finds another kind of other than Lacan talks about and that philosophers normally uh, avoid simply because it is uh, it becomes a non-philosophical experience, so to speak. And that is the experience of, uh, of the divine, uh, of, uh, of the possibility of love, the possibility of love which has a ground in some otherness which is beyond human experience, and, uh, and, and or at least to deal with it the way the non-Christian uh, religions do, and they're sort of making do with the uh, toughness of life and the tragedies of life and find nonetheless a way to adjust to that with peace and tranquility. So that uh, for uh, at this point then I, I really come to my final word by uh, presuming upon what was said this afternoon uh, by uh, the, the previous speakers. They, they did speak rather freely about the possibility of God. I would not presume to do that myself if they, were, if they don't set the, set the tone of saying it's one acceptable, uh, it's, it's an acceptable approach in the context of this. But in any case, and in any case, we can talk about, at least in philosophical terms, about a desire which we would like to call a philosopher, a philos uh, of Sophia, and say a, a desire which uh, we would attribute to a man like uh, like Socrates, you know, uh, a desire which he would be willing to call a eros, or a love, and uh, the, the love that impassions philosophers, really, who really uh, are such, uh, is the love of that kind of wisdom, a kind of truth, which another revelation will say this love uh, is love of something actually divine. So it's in that spirit then that I, 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 uh, I like to close with a few words that are very, very uh, meaningful to me personally. And, about, and I'd like to uh, 
address this to the many uh, graduate students in particular who helped uh, Richard to, through this enterprise. Uh, I myself was a great admiration of that. I've known some of the class, and they are indeed admirable people. Uh, and uh, not simply for their talents, which are extraordinary, but for the generosity and the fidelity and, and, uh, and perseverance with which they've uh, helped Richard bring this about. And to them and to all the other philosophy students here, uh, I'd like to say that even if you cannot accept a notion of love as T.S. Eliot does, as somehow uh, of a divine source, the love that brings you to philosophy is love indeed. And it's a love that Socrates uh, certainly experienced. And uh, would honor in you if you cannot uh, move beyond this uh, as, as uh, we all do. Uh, Eliot finishes little giving. And after looking at the world, it's at the end of the world, four quartets. He said, the only hope, or else despair, lies in the choice of tire or pyre. To redeem, to be redeemed from fire by fire. Who then devised this torment? Love. Love is the unfamiliar name behind the hands that wove the intolerable shirt of flame, which human power cannot remove. We only live, only suspire, commanded by either fire or fire. What we call the beginning is often the end. And to make an end, as we try to do in mind, is to make a beginning. The end is where we start from. And so, with the drawing of this love and the voice of this calling, we shall not cease from exploration. And the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started, and no other place for the first time. Thank you all. Vintage Richardson, um, that unique mix of the personal and testimonial with the philosophical and the analytic, uh, as he helped us to understand the uncanny as this unhomeliness, this Gunpanyakai, um, at the root of the two terms hostility and hospitality. Um, I think it's very fitting that Phil had the last word in many respects, but uh, in this respect, perhaps primarily, that through several and throughout several of the seminars, we have heard from time to time, and very poignantly, of the dark, ugly facts of violence, of brutality, of barbarism. We heard it in the seminar by Régine Jean Charles on the uh, African and Asian uh, racism, the barbarism of slavery and genocide in the history of America, indeed of the West. We heard it in Porik O'Malley's talk, um, a talk of personal witness about friends and acquaintances shot in their beds in Northern Ireland, where he worked for many years. We heard it more recently in Noam Chomsky's talk about hostility and hospitality in contemporary world politics, where he came back again and again to the facts, the facts of horror, the facts of bloodshed, the facts of hostility. And the fact that Bill brought this question of hostility, the dark, ugly facts, what in another sense he called the real, down to another level, as I think most of the speakers did today, uh, the ontological level of home and homelessness, that's unheimlich, the uncanny, or just now with Bill taking us psychoanalytically to the roots of the real and the struggles of the imaginary and the symbolic, of our consciousness, of our representations, of our language, to try and deal with that. So I'm very, very grateful to Bill for bringing us to that space of <coughs> reflection and, I hope, discussion. So we do have um, at least 10 minutes to take some questions uh, from the floor. 
Simon? Not quite from the floor, but from the table. <clears throat> About love, Bill. Um, does the experience of love require a divine source? Or is the experience of love in and of itself the only meaning that the divine has? That's an easy one. Philosophically, <laughs> 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 Uh, one depends on how you understand the mind source. Mm -hmm. Philosophically, you need some source. And whether one identifies that source as divine or not, or some other kind of source, uh, is uh, not a matter of indifference exactly, but uh, an indifferent question, I think, in terms of the question that you're posing. Mm -hmm. uh, and the second part of your question was, uh, is is a belief in God, if I understood the question, Simon, that, that second part, would you, would you rephrase that, please? It's just the idea that whether, <clears throat> whether love requires some sort of transcendent divine source as its basis, or whether it's simply the experience of love in and of itself that is divine. That's the issue. And I suppose my view would be the latter, yeah. for what it's worth. Yeah, uh, I, I would say it's a value in itself, uh, and uh, therefore I would look upon its relationship to the divine in the sense of uh, what it aspires to is more than uh, lovers can promise to each other on the day they, the day they get married. As I say, I think the aspiration uh, of uh, love when two people really give themselves to each other uh, and uh, to really give themselves to give them with some purpose, you know, with real purpose. You know, if you're giving yourselves, it seems to me you're giving a future, but I, you may want to question that. At any rate, I would say you're giving your future to uh, another person and uh, giving that future to another person is a giving of uh, one's poverty as well as one's uh, goodness. And that poverty is so very often debilitating. And fidelity to that love, I think, is very, <coughs> is very hard on human nature as it stands, you know, mm -hmm. given the finitude with which we go through this. And therefore, I, I think uh, that the, the, the aspiration of love to be permanent and to be faithful uh, includes uh, a, a recognition of one's poverty, you know. And uh, that recognition, that poverty, I think, would come from a recognition of some outside help to, make, uh, to remain faithful to one's commitment. But one cannot, uh, I, I, uh, one gets through life uh, without awareness of that outside source, and I wouldn't, wouldn't uh, attempt to speculate on how uh, that, that commitment is supplemented by in, invisibly by a divine source. I, I, I do think that the aspiration of love uh, 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 insists upon more than human uh, frailty can offer and guarantee with any permanence. Ah, uh, but I teach what sounds stretch our grass. <laughs> okay, David and Ed. Yeah. Um, that was just wonderful, wonderful to hear, Bill, and incredibly inspiring, I have to say. Um, your conclusion, um, just one step short of love, was that um, this um, repetition of the desire, to, of desire for this lost object is in some sense tragic. And, and bound to fail, and which sort of takes us a little bit in, in the direction of the things that Simon was talking about. Yes. But I'm reminded, and I, this is a, something I want to put to you, of that point in Nietzsche's uh, Zarathustra, where he, he's talking about eternal return, or <coughs> eternal recurrence, which is itself uh, a recognition of a kind of repetition, and says we do have a choice here. We can, as it were, just fall down and gnash our teeth and say, you know, this is the most awful thing I've ever heard. And that direction is, is nihilism. Uh, and, and 
tragedy in a, in a terrible sense. Mm -hmm. But he says there is another, another option, which is celebration and affirmation, and say, yes, this is what I, will, I, I can will. And I'm wondering whether uh, there, there, that sort of option is a way out, not a way out, but a, an option for you. That is to say that these, you could say every time we pursue this illusory dream of something else that's beautiful or a, another extraordinary possibility that we are doomed because every time it's just going to you know, deceive us and, 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 and fail us. But you could say, no, each time there's this beautiful dream, this possibility, this, this passion, and I affirm it each time, even if someone comes along and says to me, you know, it's ne you're going to die eventually, or, you know, it's never going to work out. Couldn't you just, can you not affirm the, the folly, if you like? <laughs> I think so. I mean, uh, I, I think one can, one can go with uh, Nietzsche in that, that, that far. You want to go that far, you simply affirm the moment and rejoice in the moment. And yes, the power to rejoice in the moment, how it is a symbol, a lot of bad things in the past and maybe still to come, but a lot of good things in the past and still to come. And uh, both together have made it possible for this moment now to take place. And uh, yes, I, I, that makes sense to me. That makes sense to me. I don't know how much further I want to go on uh, the implications of this. She draws, you know. I, 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 I you know, I'm a believer, and, and uh, uh, I, at this point, would uh, want to uh, explore Nietzsche a little bit further and explore further this notion of eternal return. I, I must say that it's a recent uh, appreciation of that that's been given to me by dedicated Nietzsche and to help me understand the the, the, the beauty of the moment simply because it's now. Uh, there was a great dancer and this, uh, that uh, you all know his name, the, the, the Nureyev, the rest of the cover but Nureyev. He was dying in the hospital of AIDS, apparently, and uh, dying a very painful death. And he said at one point, yes, I know, it's, uh, it's tough right now, but it, it's just so good to be alive. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I think it's that, that sense of the love of life that is communicated in the moment that you're suggesting. And yes, I would certainly honor that. I would certainly honor that and find, uh, find as I do, much in Egypt to applaud. Uh, Very good. Uh, I think probably a last question from Ed, because we have miles to grow and promises to keep him where it's, uh, it's after 6 o'clock. So perhaps this could be the that so, Bill, in, 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 in this uh, talk, um, which, are, which deeply moved me as well, um, I detected um, a, a complexity of motives. It seemed that, on the one hand, <laughs> you want to valorize the ambivalence, the bivalence, the duality of enemy, um, friend, of love and hate. Uh, this is really a very classical psychomotic. Uh, thinking, Empedoclean thinking, Freud himself cites it at one stage, uh, by a move to another level, uh, namely Das Ding, which seems somehow to, if not to undercut those alternatives, to complicate it enormously so that we can no longer say that, that this is the choice, this is the search. So it have implications for Heidegger, I think, in the very passages that Simon was quoting Heidegger, also often moving between authenticity and authenticity, yeah. nothing existence. Are you saying that uh, the Lacanian wisdom, the late Lacan, is in some respects really undercutting or throwing into a light of, let's say, comparative superficiality, this preoccupation, which was that of Freud, that of many philosophers, that of many of us, of course. Um, or are you saying something else? I, I wasn't sure what the uh, the um, the inner logic of your yeah. move was in the talk. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, <coughs> a little more about. That's a very sharp question. That 
there was a uh, double movement in the talk. Uh, that is to say, I wanted to affirm the philosophical and psychoanalytic validity of ambivalence in ah. Das Ding. That's inescapable. I want to admit that. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, and I, I believe that. Uh, but then, uh, given that uh, ambivalence and polyvalence in Das Ding, prior to any intervention of language and an imaginary language of good and evil, for example, uh, I, I uh, respect that and I honor it as a uh, position that I understand and, and, and respect. Uh, but uh, then you come to the question about dealing with it. And uh, remember Lacan says at one point, I think he's talking to the students at uh, L'Ecole Normale, I think, but on the question of religion. And uh, he, he said, well, he says in several books and places, uh, you know, that this ding is that which doesn't work, you know. Mm -hmm. And the trouble with religion, and uh, he usually means Christianity, and even Roman Catholic Christianity, which he grew up with, uh, which he always treats, uh, I shouldn't say with disdain, but with uh, disinterest, you know, or, well, anyway. I don't want to go into that, but uh, uh, he always says that religion, or he suggests that religion as a form of uh, a sublimation it shuts his eyes to the religion and distracts us with uh, beauty and harmony and all that sort of thing, you know, but it, it, it never really faces up to the real, and the only other thing to do is face up to it. And uh, I deeply believe, if I can speak personally, I think that, I think that uh, in Christianity at least, you know, I wouldn't presume to speak for a lot of religious orientations, uh, resolve this question, but speaking, you're asking me personally, I'm giving you a personal answer. In Christianity at least, it does not turn away from the real. I think that any kind of realistic assessment of the crucifixion, however you interpret it, and uh, whether, whether you insist upon the resurrection as part of it, uh, at least to recognize that much in the crucifixion of someone who claims to be God and submits to this and accepts this and says yes to this, that's not avoiding the real. That's facing it. Right? Especially when one's able to see that there's a way of living in union with that, you know, through the suffering one's own, well, one's own life, which uh, becomes quite real all the time. So uh, I think Christianity, at least, does face the real, so it's not true to say that it avoids it. Well, thank you all for coming. I'd like to ask you to join me in expressing our gratitude to Bill and our other five guests today. Thank you.